not loud enough. Something, something that doesn't work there. either. Well, okay, that that should do it. Okay, so everybody's had a nice meal, I take it. Uh, I know some people are still very tired from the trip, and I don't want to keep us up too late. So I just want to do this have a short talk, um, and then we'll decide what to do. If people, it may be if people would like to hear some music, we'll have some music. If people are too tired, we don't have to, we'll decide later. Okay. So there'll be five minutes of music afterwards, so you know, <coughs> it's not too bad. So let me just, um, let me just do this. So, too many things. Um, the good news is through this entire meeting, there will be only three formal presentations. The first one, the last one, and never again. Which is, okay, so this is a joke that Vishnu always said if we went to a bad restaurant, she'd say we've been there three times, first time, last time, and never again. So this is it. Um, this is the only formal presentation there will be, uh, and it's not going to be too long, and I hope it won't be too painful. Um, what I want to do is just explain to you why we're here and how we got here, and get us all thinking about where we're going. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, which I guess everybody knows, well, most people here know, some people don't, um, is something I talked about in the summer school this summer, and I'll just repeat it. So some of you have heard this, of what I, I call the quantum relay. Um, when I think about the history of quantum theory, it occurs to me, and I think, it's, I think everybody here will agree, that there is this nail-biting kind of precariousness about being serious of thinking about quantum theory. Uh, that in the first half of the 20th century, it was almost Einstein and Schrodinger alone who were really on target and really thinking about what the problems of understanding the theory were and articulating the important arguments. And you know, they were largely ignored, amazingly, when you think about it. Einstein and Schrodinger <laughs> largely ignored and sidelined and insulted and, and so on. And to me, the story of Bohm is very poignant in this, right? Because Bohm writes his textbook on quantum theory as a convinced Copenhagen person and lays down what many people have said is the clearest account of the Copenhagen approach and has a meeting with Einstein when Einstein is now, you know, really getting quite old. And I, you know, I, I'm sure, again, most people, but not everybody in this room knows the story that Bohm publishes the book. He's hoping that maybe he's in Princeton, Einstein's in the, in the institute in Princeton. He's hoping he can get an audience with Einstein to talk about it. And out of the blue, Einstein calls him up and says, I just read your book. I think it's a, you know, the best presentation of Copenhagen I've ever seen. Would you like to come talk about it? And Bohm goes to the institute and comes back and announces, I'm back to square one, right? Einstein talked me out of the whole thing. And that's, I think, 1951. And you know, it doesn't take him long to rediscover the pilot wave theory and to publish that in 1952. Um, but there's Einstein more or less close to the end of his career passing the torch to Bohm. And Bohm, through no, I mean, not only through no fault of his own, but through his own moral virtue, falls into a terrible situation politically and gets exiled and 
his theory is not paid any attention to and is actively suppressed, but it manages to get into Bell's hands, and that wakes Bell up, and he sort of carries the torch and manages to prove his theorem, and keep the tradition going, and that eventually falls into the hands of Shelley and Detlef and Nino, and they, you know, keep the tradition going. Now, at least there are three. I mean, how lucky, it's just how much this was hanging on by its fingernails, right? How lucky they were to find each other and to support each other through the really bad times. And that we've come to a point where there's a critical mass of people who are serious, who understand the problems, who think clearly, and many of whom, you know, maybe the majority of the world are in this room right now. Um, and so the basic thought is, If you have a critical mass, you've got to get people all together, right? You've got to bring the critical mass together and have the interactions, and then it'll propagate. And that, and that I, I hope that we've reached a point where that can happen. And more or less what I've been trying to do is create a place where it can happen. Um, I, I've been thinking about the situation in foundations more and more. Um, and maybe in the last 10 years or so, thinking about the basic problem, which is that it doesn't have institutional recognition. Right? That, that if, you're, if you work in foundations of physics, you'd naturally think your home would be in a physics department, but ironically, that's the least uh, welcoming place, <laughs> probably. Um, you're, pretty welcome in a philosophy department, uh, and you can be at least tolerated in some math departments, maybe not so much in other math departments, but <laughs> ironically, you can more make a career, I think, more easily make a career as a mathematical physicist doing foundational work than you can as a physicist if you're basically focused on foundational work. Um, and so for a, a while, I was thinking the only solution to this is to create a department or a program in foundations. And because I'm at NYU, and at least it used to be that there was a certain amount of money floating around subterraneanly somewhere, um, I used to think, well, maybe I could figure out how to create an official program at NYU. Maybe, you know, then you start thinking, I need to find some donors, I need to get to the deans, I need to do this and that. And what happened was eventually you fantasize about this. And you say, wouldn't it be great if there were actually a home, an institutional home for foundations of physics? Um, but if you're kind of obsessive about working out all the details, your fantasies can kind of go sour on you. And I got to the point where I realized that, that even if all of that went well, even if you could find some mega rich person who would endow this and that and go to the deans and they would give you the money and they would give you the room, everything like that, you still wouldn't really be anywhere because the fact is you would then have to hire a faculty. And there are very few people who you'd really want to hire. And they're rational people, which means that even if you waved a little money at them, they wouldn't do a crazy thing, which is pull up their roots and move. So even if everything went as well as it could possibly go, you get to the last point and you realize it still wouldn't work out the way you wanted it to. And what happened then was, uh, the epiphany happened this summer, and that has 
a long backstory to it, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. But the main epiphany was because we put on the summer school on entropy in Split, and I thought it went very well. And you realize that during the summer, everybody, except Howard, is available. <laughs> um, and so people who are located all over the world can, in principle, come together and form a coherent group for a few months and put on summer schools and teach a new generation about these things. And that the, the right solution was not to try and create a department, say at NYU, but to create what hopefully this will become, a kind of home for the work that has a faculty, but not a faculty that's paid, unfortunately for you, um, <laughs> paid, for, <laughs> paid by the institution, right? Everybody has their home place, but a place where we can all come together and work collaboratively. Um, and it, that just occurred to me at the end of the summer school, which was in July, and everything's happened since then, right? Everything up until now has happened over, over that period of time. And now the thing exists in many senses, um, not, hope, not entirely as we hope it will exist, but I don't think... I hope it can't be killed at this point. Um, I just wanted to tell a few little stories about how precarious even this was. Um, so in a little more detail, and because many of you know many of you, but a few of you don't know anybody, and there are a few people here that almost nobody knows, I want for everybody to know a little bit about the background. So the first more or less chance thing that happened was Vishna and I, our family, had been coming to Croatia to Hvar every summer for years and years, and basically, by accident, we met Franja. So for, any, for many of you who don't know him, you can stand up. This is Franjo Sokolic, who's at the University of Split. Um, and Franjo, we just started talking about foundations of physics, and he was a kind of ball of energy and organized a kind of mini conference more or less on the spot, and then kept that energy going year after year. I mean, it was one day, and then the next year it was two days, and then the next year it was three days, and then it became an associated summer school. And all of that was really Franjo's doing, and that all happened by accident. And eventually, when I think you know, he quite rightfully got a little tired, he said to, to me and to Chris, well, maybe next year you guys can organize <laughs> the summer school, and so we did and organized the summer school on entropy, which was then sort of the, the proximate thing. So that was all kind of accidental. Um, at this same time, this summer, we were thinking about trying to buy a place on Hoar, and so happened to be looking at the uh, real estate ads, and I noticed that there was a half-finished hotel that was for sale. And I thought, boy, that would be a kind of perfect thing. If you could get that, and it's not finished, and you could make adjustments to it and turn it into a center, because we've just had, you know, Croatia, the Croatian coast is the best possible place you could be in the summer. If you wanted a place that people will just want to be for no other reason than to be there, that's where you want to be. And so I got this idea, maybe we could manage to buy this hotel and turn it into this institute. And that's what got the whole ball rolling. And then, you know, then things happened in a kind of semi-logical way. I organized the Board of Governors 
the, which are the six of us, and then we collectively figured out who the faculty should be and who the other fellows should be, and you know. But I came because I'd never actually seen this hotel. I'd just seen pictures of it, and Chris was going to far after the summer school, so he actually went to see it and reported back a little bit on it. And so I came uh, back for the conference that, that Pranyo had organized, and I said, I should go over and look at this hotel. And there are various ways you can get to far. The slowest way is on the car ferry. There are little um, catamarans that are faster, and there's a big, slow two-hour car ferry, and we took the car ferry. And the nice thing about the car ferry is it's huge, and you can walk around, and there's lots of space. And it was a beautiful day, so Franjo and I were sitting on the back in the open air and chatting, and I had bought a whole bunch of pastries. And uh, at some point, I've been trying to keep my exercise up, so I said, I'm going to go for a walk, and I left. And I came back after a while. And there is Franjo just in a conversation with this guy who had come out to the back to take a smoke. And he said, uh, this is a ship's captain. Um, and I said, that's interesting. You know, are you, are, are you off the bridge? Because I was thinking he was this ship's captain. But no, it turned out he was just generically a ship's captain. So that person turned out to be Ivan Saric, who almost nobody here knows. But this is a very important, critical linchpin. <laughs> and if Franjo weren't such a friendly guy, I mean, quite honestly, if it had just been me sitting there, I would never have struck up a conversation with the guy who came back to smoke. But Franjo's a fr friendly guy. And they fell into a conversation. And I had a bunch of pastries. And I said, here, have a you know, pastry. And we were just talking. Um, and one thing I highly recommend this weekend, if you get a chance, and you want to hear about a life that is as different from an academic career as is humanly possible, <coughs> sit and talk to Ivan <laughs> about what his life has been. Because it's just, I mean, he just has story after story. I mean, we were spellbound about his life as a ship's captain and what happened to him. And um, we didn't explain why we were going to far. You know, we were just chatting. And at some point, and I don't know why it came up, Ivan said, you know, I actually have a house and some buildings that I'm thinking of selling on far. And, and Franjo started looking at me. You know, it's like this conversation is going on, and, and Franjo looks at me, and I look at Franjo, and Franjo looks at me. And Franjo says, do you think we should tell him why we're going to FAR? And I said, yeah, I think we should tell him why we're going to FAR. We're going to FAR to look at this hotel, because we're thinking of buying this hotel to turn it into this institute. And Ivan says, no, you mean that place? I know that. No, you don't want to buy that place. He says, you, you should come see my place. <laughs> This was completely unplanned, right? This was completely by chance. And we followed him in his car and went to, his, to the villa and had lunch and met his wife. And it was clear that if we could make this work, this would be 100% more than that, better than the thing I was thinking of. And this was all just completely by accident. Um, so that's how we got here. <laughs> um, let me just say a little bit about, about where we are. What have I actually done, or what have we done? Um, so this is the location, for those of you who haven't studied at the website. These pictures are on the website, too, but you can see Boyanich Bad is this tiny village on the coast of the island of Far. And you come off the main road, and then where the red circle is, is, is the villa. And from there, it's just right down to the sea. And I, I mean, I can't <coughs> forego mentioning that all of this greenery, this uh, trees between the villa and the sea, that 
can't be built on. So that's going to be protected forever. So if you know, we will we will be in that situation. Um, and this is the villa as it is now. The, there was a, this near nearest building was your family's your father built right? Is that the stone building? Um, was was their family summer home, and then Ivan has been building these other apartments. So there's already a lot of very nicely built infrastructure that we can use immediately. And there's land all around it, and there's places where more can be built. So we have plans and plans and plans that could go on for years of making it better and better. But as it is now, uh, except for one thing which we'll talk about, which is just to need a lecture hall, it's as they say, in move-in condition, basically. Um, and just to, there's, you know, the original, I mean, I'm trying to convince everybody that you want to come see this place, because I can't, you know, the pictures can't really convey it, but that's the original stone house. There's the big terrace, right? Um, so you can imagine sitting on this terrace discussing quantum theory, overlooking the Adriatic. You know, I, so this is part of the theory is you can't separate those two. Part of the theory of this is that really productive work and relaxation and enjoyment are really inseparable. And, you know, don't stress out about it. Uh, this is, I just wanted to give you pictures of this is a, you know, it's literally a four-star apartment. Um, beautiful, right? Just, again, I'm just trying to convince you. Uh, we, we may have, you know, you may, you, you may have to rough it because these are not individual rooms, so you might have to, sleep in the loft and share a bathroom with somebody for a while, okay? So it'll be tough, right? So, you know, screw your courage to the sticking spot um, if that is what happens, right? There's, you know, sit on the balcony. This is the little private path that goes from the villa down to the sea. Um, that's what you can expect to find when you, when you get there. <laughs> it's very quiet, it's a small place. Um, but it's, it's ideal, as far as I can tell. So that's, oh, and Ivan makes his own wine now. <laughs> yeah, excellent wine. Um, and we, we, will, we will continue the wine making tradition. We have several people who are fellows who said they were very excited to learn how to make wine. Um, so. so this is what can happen, right? This is what we have. This is the opportunity that has been fallen in our laps. Uh, that's the physical place. There are some other things that I'm trying to arrange. Um, and when I was thinking about this speech, I said, you know, there's a sense in which I've been working on, well, my life is going into this speech the way my life is going into this institute. Not that I've been working on it my whole life, but it is in some sense the sum total of what I would like a place to be. in every respect I can think of. And you know, this might strike you as strange or silly, but suck it up. This is what it is. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what, I, what I'm doing. Um, so I'm thinking about visually, right? What will you see? Um, so we've got, 
I would like this guy, I can't get in contact with him, but I, we can buy his stuff. David Borchert does cartoons. I saw this one, this one was recently in the, in the New Yorker, and I fell in love with it. Um, I don't know if you can read it. Can people read it, right? So it, it says, once the koalas taste shark, they never go back to eucalyptus. Um, and I thought, th this, is, this is going to be the iconic image of this institute. And if, if just beyond it, I just found it hilarious, but just beyond it being hilarious, you can think of the koala as the foundations of physics, which has had this very soft and, and you know, vulnerable situation. And think of the shark as the rest of physics. <laughs> uh, Borchardt, it turns out, I, for whatever reason, Borchardt, I just, I find him really hilarious. We're, I'm gonna have, I'm not gonna show all of them because it would take the fun away, but he has a lot of work that you can get. I'll just show you one more that I like a lot. Um, again, if you can't read it, the subtitle is, now you're just being a jerk. Um, and I, I just think it's, you know. So we're gonna have a lot of David Borchard around. <laughs> um, I hope, I haven't talked to him yet, there's an artist named Janino Bozic, who, if you know my book, The Metaphysics Within Physics, this is the cover of the book because we actually own that piece. And we've talked to him. Um, and I'm hoping if we get enough resources to be able to make him a fellow and, 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 and uh, engage him to make art for the Institute. Because I like his art. <laughs> What can I say? You can't see that very well, but it's, it's much nicer, and, and I couldn't, didn't have a very good picture of it. So I've been thinking visually, you know, what, when you're there in the Institute, what will you see? Um, as, you, as you know, well, as you're about to find out, I've been thinking orally, what, what would you like to hear? <laughs> and so we have with us we have two actual Bell Fellows who are, are artists. Peter Finger, who is here, if you can just. Many of you have heard Peter play because he's played at several of the things that Detlef organized. And, uh, and we have Jerry Reif, who none of you know, but you're going to get to know. Jerry um, is a clarinetist who taught my children and has a Dixieland jazz band. And again, you know, why do I want this? Well, because I like this. I like it. I like this. I listen to this music all the time. It makes me feel good. It puts me in a good frame of mind. And I want to share it with people. But I, I can also tell a story, however um, convincing it is, in the case of Jerry, there's one piece which I'm about to play, which is, uh, I guess it's well known in, in New Orleans, in funerals, the tradition is you'll have a band, a jazz band, that plays a dirge as they're taking the casket to the burial spot. And, but after it's buried, they then play the same tune, but in an upbeat, right? And so there's this transition of the same theme from a mournful kind of tone to a joyous one. And I sort of feel that way about foundations of physics, right? We've been in a sort of near-death situation for many, many decades, but that very same theme can become very lively. Uh, and the other thing I like about it is how much in the jazz there's distinctive individual voices and then collaborative. Then everybody gets together and plays together. And everybody's doing their own thing, but also listening to everybody else and adjusting. And so to me, it's a kind of image of what we want to do. And I wanted to play this one piece, which I myself have, I'm sure, listened to hundreds of times. Um, 
that begins and ends with a, with a solo um, that just makes the hair stand up on my neck. Um, and I just, I, I just want to play it just because I want to play it. So if this works, it should play. No? Come on. No? Come on. Let me do it by hand. And I hope you can hear this. Let's see. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. And I didn't want to do that either. And I don't want to do that. All right, it's back here. Now, let's play. So I hope you can hear this. Let me turn this around.
So everybody is going to get a CD. <laughs> this is the first thing on it. And there's things by Jerry, and there's pieces by Peter um, from one of his CDs. There's one by Barbara Carroll, the song Just Because I Like It. If we can, this, uh, uh, what can I say? This is what humanity is capable of if we can do something half that good, you know, we'll be doing well. Um, I, I'm trying as best I can to create a spirit of the place and make it different from any other place that exists. Um, and I'm just trying to convey what that is. Um, Maybe more seriously, I hope, and this is up to you, but I'm just giving my observations. Uh, one of the pieces that's a background to this whole thing is something I've been doing for, gosh, over 15 years, almost 20 years. And the story of that is Many years ago, um, when I was at Rutgers, I got money on an annual basis to put on conferences. And they, Rutgers was nice enough to give this to me. They didn't actually consult me too much about it, because I realized once I had it that one thing I hate is conferences. Um, and organizing them even worse, but mostly attending them. Uh, and so for several years, this money just accumulated. I didn't use any of it because I just wasn't in the mood to. And when enough of it had accumulated, I thought I really ought to do something. And I thought, look, this is my money. Um, I should do with it what I actually think would be useful. And the problem with conferences for me is very simple that somebody gets up and talks for 45 minutes, and then there's 15 minutes of 
question and answer. And nothing ever gets done, because it can't. Um, my, I, I would sit down with David Albert, and David and I agree on 95% of stuff, but disagree on the remaining 5%. And we would sit for two hours, just the two of us, to try and figure out what we were even disagreeing about and to try and get to what are the basic issues between us. And if it takes two hours with one person, you know, what can be done in an effective way in 15 minutes? And uh, my, my view was that, that I, I can imagine if I was an experimentalist and all I had to do was present some results that I could get up in 15 or 20 minutes and say, we did this, we made these observations, these are the results, and people could say, which instruments did you use, and did you account for this? And I could say yes or no, and that could be an effective means of doing business. But in foundations, it just isn't. And so what I decided to do was to have something called a workshop, which, whose hallmark was that it had zero structure. Um, there were usually between five and eight of us Many people in this room have attended once or twice. Many haven't. Um, and we would just we would go to the Mirror Lake Inn, which is where the faculty meeting will be held next year, and get together the first day and say, "Okay, what do you want to talk about?" And we'd make a rough list of some topics in some order. And if somebody wanted to give a presentation, they sort of could, but. It was fair game, um, by which I mean there was one point where I wanted to give a kind of formal PowerPoint presentation of something I'd been working on. And 45, I'm not exaggerating, 45 minutes into my, in, after I began, we had not gotten beyond the title. Because I put up the title and then a question, well, why did you put it that way? Or what, you know, and we got one thing led to another. <laughs> um, and to me, this is what was useful, right? To me, over these years, year after year, and Nino's been there and Shelley's been there, and Detlef always refused to come. Uh, <laughs> uh, To me, this was useful, okay? To have essentially no time limits. You talk until you get tired, then you take a break, and then you go down to the pool and you talk some more. And you, when you finally have, feel like you've exhausted something, you go on to the next thing and you cover as much as you can cover. To me, this has been effective. I mean, for, for my own work, it's been very hard to try and scale it up. You can do it with six, seven, eight people if they're the right people. If they're the wrong people, you can't do it with any of them, right? So you need the right people in the right frame of mind who can communicate with each other, um, who don't get too offended if you call them crazy. Part of this is kind of, at least part of it, the part of it that I'll be in charge of is to see whether this can be scaled up a bit and whether Larger summer schools can be run on a much looser basis, not programmed out. Um, but you're free, every one of you on the faculty is free to experiment however you like. Right? I'm not imposing this on anyone. What I'm trying to do is say we're starting something new and we're starting it with zero presuppositions about how it should be done. And it's a moment, I hope, for everybody to just think in your own life what's been useful, what's been not useful, how might things be done differently so they could be done better, experiment. I hope that that'll be part of the spirit of the Institute, which is why I like the jazz, because it has an experimental improvisational air to it, right? I hope we'll have an improvisational spirit. Um, why in the world have I done this? Okay, you know, you might ask, 
what's the motivation? And I figured I'll, you know, uh, I'll say this once. This is going to be reported, so I won't have to repeat this. I hit 60, and you know, you hit 60 and you start thinking. Um, it didn't help that Bell died at 62. And you know, you really, there's a certain point, I guess, part of it's being a philosopher, because if you're a philosopher, at least, and you teach certain things, I've taught Plato's Republic many, many times. And in the Republic, there is the philosopher in the ideal state, the main thing they're trying to do, the whole structure of the ideal state, is to identify people who have an aptitude for philosophy and train them and encourage them. And the hardest thing to do, there's there, there are a, a series of things you go through. And you start with arithmetic, you start with geometry, you start with mathematics. You basically learn clear logical thinking. But according to Plato, and I think there's a great deal of wisdom in what he says, the nature of mathematics is that you're given certain axioms as granted, and you're figuring out what follows from them. But the really hard thing is to figure out which axioms you ought to be starting with. Right? The really hard thing is the investigation into the foundation, foundational principles themselves. And that whereas mathematics can proceed in a logical manner, in an al almost algorithmic manner, the identification of fundamental principles can't. And what that requires is dialectic. I mean, the method that Plato talked about was dialectic. And that after four or five years of training in, these, in, in, in arithmetic, then geometry, then solid geometry, then the theory of motion, I mean, various things. You then were supposed to go study dialectic for 40 years. And when you were 60, the people who had been supported and allowed the luxury to do this, which is an amazing luxury, which I've had as a philosopher, and a tremendous amount of freedom to investigate whatever interested me and do whatever I wanted with it with very little pressure. I mean, unlike the pressure of people in physics departments who just can't do that. I've been unbelievably lucky. And after 40 years in the Republic, you then go to these people and you say, it's now your turn. You now have to go. You have to give up what you'd really like to be doing, which is just doing pure theory. And you have to go down and govern the city for 10 years. And the theory was, if you really understood things that you were supposed to have learned in those 40 years, you'd be better than anybody else at the practical work of governance. Because you would understand the ideals you were aiming at. You would understand the form of the good. And you can never realize the form of the good in the actual physical world, because the physical world, the matter it's made out of is recalcitrant and imperfect, and there will always be problems. So you know, I tried to create in this Mirror Lake thing something that was sort of more ideal, but I was stuck with matter like Shelley. Okay? So there's only so much you can do. There are going to be problems. Um, but you do the best you can. So you hit 60 as a philosopher, and you say, you've been given this incredible privilege to be very self-indulgent. And maybe it's time to give back and try and create something. So all of these things came together at the same time. And so that's what I've been doing for the last six months. Um, there are some people who say, gosh, you, must, you just you must be working 24 hours a day on this. I haven't been. I mean, it's, it's been a certain amount of work. It's not that overwhelming. Um, 
But the main thing is that the only way you can do it, and I'm trying, again, to convey this to everybody here, is to be in the, frame of, the same frame of mind the one time in my life I went hang gliding, which was right after when I was a graduate student, we took our comprehensive exams, and then we were all in kind of semi-suicidal mood. So we said, let's go hang gliding. Um, and, and this was, you know, you had to strap this big kite on your back and run down a hill. And, you know, the one thing the guy said was, you better commit to this, right? When you start running, if you're going to do this, you better not you put all your doubts aside, right? Put all of your fears aside, because if you start to doubt and delay, you're certainly going to crash, right? You're certainly going to mess up. The only way you're going to succeed is to just assume you're going to succeed and commit yourself to it. And that's what I've done. Because I, you know, if I, it could go wrong in any number of ways. It could still go wrong in any number of ways. But I've had to just put that aside and assume it's going to work out and act as if it's going to work out. And what I'm at the point now, um, I've, done a lot. Mario, if you've seen the website, put a tremendous amount of work into that. It's just at the point where the work to make it work has to be everybody on the faculty, to some extent, wanting it to work, wanting it to succeed. And basically, that's what this whole meeting is about. It's just, first of all, some of you don't know. Everybody doesn't know everybody, so it's just a chance as a faculty meeting to literally meet other faculty and, and Yvonne and Jerry and Peter. And um, I hope that everybody, you know, starts to gel and feel that this is a kind of home. Um, so I've done all this work. What, what do I want back? Because I'm at the point, this is a kind of phase transition. Um, the first period was me kind of thinking it up on my own. Then I got the Board of Governors together. Then there was a pretty intensive period of the six of us working together to choose the faculty and the fellows. Uh, the Board of Governors doesn't have much to do anymore. Then it's been mostly Mario and me doing some things. And now Yvonne's been doing a tremendous amount. He's, he's really committed himself to wanting this to work. He's been unbelievably generous about trying to make this something that we can do. And you know, he's thinking all the time about what we need to build and how to do it. And so, um, but now it's a phase transition for it to really succeed. It has to be used. I mean, we can, we can do everything we can to make this thing available. And it will work if it's used. If people organize summer schools or organize workshops or just come on their own and are there and make it a lively place. And if enough people do that, it will work. And if you don't, it won't. And, you know, so this is a point where I'm sort of taking this and handing it over from me, I mean, I'll still be involved in a practical way, but the main heart of it, I'm handing it over to you. Um, what do I want back? The only thing I can say that I would like <coughs> very much is a sense of intellectual integrity and honesty, that whatever you do, Everybody remains open-minded, willing to listen to contrary points of view, willing to, you know, take a contrary argument to what you're trying to argue and make it as strong as you can rather than as weak as you can to, you know, not push any problems under the rug. I feel like I've been privileged in a way I don't deserve to have met Shelley you know, to just be in the same place. And I could have been at Rutgers and not even met him. Those of you who've been to Rutgers know that 
The philosophy department is not physically near the physics department. If it wasn't for another set of coincidences, which I won't go into, I never would have even met Shelley, and through him, Detlef and Nino. Um, but it's always been an honest, honest conversation, right? It's always been people doing their best to really understand him. And that's what I hope everybody will try to maintain. Um, so you might ask, <laughs> what have you done to deserve this? Um, and I want to answer, I mean, I do want to say a word about that. I'm, as you can tell from us being here in this hotel and the dinner you just ate, I'm trying to make this as nice as possible. Right? I'm trying to make it as civilized and refined and enjoyable as humanly possible. Um, and I believe that everybody in the faculty deserves that. Because everybody who's committed themselves to doing foundations of physics has done it against the tide has gone against their obvious self-interest in certain ways, has chosen a road that is very difficult. Fortunately, not as difficult now as it was when Detlef and Shelley and Nino, for example, chose to do it and had to fight. At, and. I think everybody in the field deserves to be treated well. I think it's been an act of intellectual courage that everybody in this room has undertaken. And I'm, I was a Boy Scout, so we're almost at the end. And one thing, the one thing I can say I really remember as a Boy Scout was there was a rule. And the rule was you leave the campsite better than you found it. And, you know, as a philosopher, I'm one of those, you know, you, 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 you take a principle and you say, okay, let's take this to the end. And you realize it's a weird principle, right? It's actually a strange principle. Because as long as there are a bunch of slobs around, it's really easy, right? You come to a campsite and there's a bunch of litter and trash that people have, before you have left. And you know, as a decent person, you don't leave your own trash. But you say, no, no, it's, it's, I have to do more than that, right? I have to actually leave it better than I found it. It's not just that I can't make it worse. I have to pick up, you know, pack out somebody else's trash, which, and you see that, you know, that's a very nice principle. But then you realize it's kind of a weird principle, because if you're a Kantian and you say, what if everybody adopted it? Then there'd be no trash to begin with, right? Then it wouldn't be so easy, right? You'd actually have to think, how do I make the campsite even better, right? You'd get into a kind of helix uh, that would have no top of ever improve, you know, you, you, there'd be this phase transition. It'd be sort of an amazing thing. Well. In foundations of physics, we've been left lots and lots and lots of trash. Piles and piles of it. So we're not going to have that problem for a long time. But again, I guess I just have ha reached a certain age and thought, I want to leave the campsite better than I found and that we need an institution like this to do that. That we're, as a group, we're too scattered geographically, we're too scattered across different disciplines, we're in different parts of the university, we don't have a natural home, and in order to thrive as a field, we need a home. A physical home, a home where we can come and teach a new generation, and just sit around and talk to each other, to make progress. And this is my attempt to do it as best I can 
in the way I personally think would be nice. And I'm not in control of this thing anymore. I mean, once it, it's, it's in the hands of the faculty, and I'm just a faculty member like everybody else, to think up workshops, think up summer schools, think of how to use the facilities in a useful way. Um, and so this is kind of the moment when I'm taking that part of the torch in the relay and, and handing it off to all of you. So tomorrow morning we have, I've booked a room for three hours. I have, I'll tell you a little bit more because I haven't gone into any of the actual practical details of where we are and what we need to do and what the prospects are. And I didn't want to do that tonight. I just wanted to try and explain the spirit of what I've been trying to achieve and hopefully get everybody to feel like they want it to exist. Because I think if everybody wants it to exist, it will. And so have a good time. Right, um, and Jerry's going to play for five minutes, um, I think, or not. Okay. Okay, that's fine. We said we we decide at the time, so we will we will hear from our Bell Fellow artists, Bell Institute artists tomorrow. Um, after the three hours tomorrow, I. You know, I didn't want to schedule anything. I said I'm kind of against schedules. There may be that groups of you think, gee, maybe we can put on a workshop or maybe we can do something this summer and you can get together and talk to each other. You can go visit Zagreb. It would be nice if you got to know some of the people who you don't know. Um, so we can start to form a kind of coherent group. That's what this is about. So enjoy.